Welcome everyone. Hope you can all see me and hear me. Okay, we'll start. Um, before we get going, I would very much like to thank the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for actually enabling us to have these programs. This is the first of our session, sessions looking at play and movement for, for children. And I thought our first session would be around why that movement is so important to children and a little bit about how things have changed, maybe the way parenting skills have changed and how, how the kind of um, environment our children grow up in is probably very different to the environment that we grew up in. When I was a child, I spent a lot of my time outside playing, um, climbing trees, running around, and I tended to go home when I was hungry or when it got dark or I could hear my mum calling us to go back in again. And things are quite different now. So what we're going to be looking at is why movement is so very important. I think recently we've become um, very concerned about um, the academic progress of our children and in attempting to help them do well at school, we've maybe ignored some of the movement development that children actually need. So what I'd like to talk about is, you know, why is it important to start off with? Why is it, if you think about it, um, with babies, um, their first interactions with the world are through movement. They eat, they sleep, and they move. So we need to be thinking about why is that? So movement is the first interaction with the world and it's the way that they learn around about the world. So movement is very, very important for children. A lot of children's brain development comes from their movement. What I'd like you to think about is when your children were very small, how did they first start moving? So things like they learned, first of all, to lift their head. Then they learn to be able to push up onto their shoulders. So children's gross development starts, motor skills development starts from their head and goes down to their feet. So think about lifting the head, lifting the shoulders, then being able to sit up like I am with that stability and then eventually being able to walk. So their motor skills develop from the top down and then they develop from the inside out. So they start moving big parts of their bodies first before they then start um, moving smaller parts of their bodies. So what I'd like us to be thinking about all the time is how that, what, how that development looks. We have a lot of focus at the moment about movement and about children being obese and not moving as well as they um, might have done. And also some children with increasing mental health pro uh, problems. Um, and we all know that when we're a little bit stressed, sometimes a bit of movement can actually help us to feel a little bit better. What I'd like to do to just sort of set up how important movement is to our physical health is just show you a short video and then I'm going to just sit quietly for about 60 seconds after that video is finished just for you to um, take in the messages from that video and please use our chat um, button to be asking questions. Um, the more we can interact with me and with each other, the more we can learn. So when we come to asking questions, please, there's never a silly question. Just ask, see what you think. If anybody's got any comments after the video, um, please put those in the chat box too. So if you could play our video, please, now, and just have a look at this to set the scene for why movement is important. So if you just have a little think about that, if anyone has any comments um, they would like to put in the chat box, please feel free. So what we need to be thinking about as parents 
is why is it so different for children nowadays? What is it that we are doing differently? And I'd like you to maybe just take a minute to reflect on how much movement you, your children do and how many opportunities for movement they have during the day compared to what you had when you were younger. I'm just going to give you a minute to think about that. Okay then, moving on. So we started to talk, um, you can see from that video, um, problems that we have of children, lack of moving, some of that will be around diet and nutrition. And I know that you are getting a session in amongst these later on, which will be looking at children's nutrition. Um, but what I'd like you to think about now is if we're talking about the way children, natural development happens, and I think what we've got to be aware of is every child is different um, and they might develop at different rates, but they will develop in the same way. So the motor skill development follows the same process for all children, even though it might be at different rates. However, we sometimes have the idea or the misconception that children just develop physical skills naturally, but that's not the case. Children need to have a lot of practice um, and a lot of opportunities to move to be able to develop those physical skills. So the more opportunities we can give them, the better it is. But if we think about um, not only we're going to move on in some of the other sessions about the kind of physical activity we can do and developing physical literacy, but in this session, what I wanted us to think about is how is movement important to every area of children's lives? So we talked a little bit about the head to toe development of gross motor skills and the inside out development for gross motor skills. So what I'd like you to think about is when a child goes to school and they're sitting at a desk, what they need to have is good core stability. Otherwise, they can't actually sit still at their desks. They also need to have strong shoulders because if we remember about motor skills developing from the inside out, if they don't have strong shoulders, that means that actually they, don't, they can't develop the fine motor skills. And that is a skill that is um, really important in school. We often worry about children's handwriting, about their fine motor skills. And sometimes in schools, the answer to children who are struggling with handwriting is to ask them to do more handwriting practice or lots of fine motor skill practice. So they might be threading needles or fastening buttons. But what we've got to think about with some children is actually the fine motor skills aren't the problem, the gross motor skills are the problem. So we need to be looking at making sure the big muscles, the gross motor skills are all developed and then the fine motor skills can develop from that. So if we think about handwriting, we need a good strong shoulders and we need a good strong core before we're able to actually pick up a pencil and use it properly. We need to be able to sit up at our desks and to actually do that, we need some core strength. And if we think about some of the activities that children may spend more time doing, um, if they're watching TV or they're sitting playing on an iPad and they're sitting down, they're not actually getting the chance to develop that core motor uh, core strength. So what we're looking at is how we can help children develop the strength, which will then actually impact on their academic learning because they need those motor skills. One of the other things that we need to look at 
is something that's called crossing the midline. And what I'd like, this is a, almost like having an imaginary line down the middle of your body. And it's a very important development mental milestone for children to be able to cross the, the midline. And you may say, well, what difference does that make? If I just show you um, very quickly, if you think of a baby, and you might see a baby sitting on the floor, they pick up a toy in one hand, they pass it into this hand, and then they put it down with that hand. You don't see babies reaching across like that because they can't. Um, so what we look at is how they develop activities to cross the midline. And activities that cross the midline are when arms can go across, when feet can go across, and all of those, those activities, you may think, well, does it matter if they can't do that? But one of the important parts of crossing the midline is the more children cross the midline, the more connections they make from one side of the brain to the other. So it's actually helping their academic um, abilities as well as their physical abilities. But learning to cross the midline comes from movement. And we're going to do some activities later on to actually look at how you can develop that. What I'd like to look at again is from um, an academic point of view, if I can find my book. If children can't cross the midline, then when they come to school, they find it very difficult to finger point. So that means when they're learning to read, and you will have done this with your children, and they have their finger on the book and they slide their finger on while they're actually reading. If they can't cross the midline, they can't do that because their hand can't physically go across the book to actually be able to do that. If their hands don't cross the midline, neither do their eyes. So they're able to read one page and then they have to turn their head to read the other page. And actually after a lot of to and froing, they get sore necks. So they're actually getting a little bit of, mm, I don't like reading because it makes my neck tired. It also becomes even more obvious um, when children learn to write. So again, if they're sitting at their desk and they're trying to write, they can't take their arm across that side to be able to write. So what children tend to do, and you'll probably remember this from when you were in a classroom, they push their chairs back, they lie their books along the table, they lie their heads on and they write up sideways. And often when I talk to teachers about this, they all laugh because they've seen lots of children doing that. So actually being able to cross the midline is a very important prerequisite um, for reading, for writing. And that comes again from, um, from movement and from interacting with equipment um, and activities. So what I'd like us to do now is actually have a look at some of the activities. As part of this session, you do have a handout um, which you will have access to after the session. So what I thought it would be nice to do is for us to actually look at some other activities that we can do. And hopefully you have your children with you so we can actually um, look at some of these activities together. So what I'd like to start off with is a really nice one for little ones is moving like animals. So if we think about, there are lots of books about animals, things like deer zoo, commotion in the ocean, um, giraffes can't dance, those sort of activities, uh, those sort of books that we can actually look at and, and talk to children about how they think those animals might move. But what I'd like to do now, as I'm showing you, is talk about how moving like these animals actually helps us build that shoulder strength and that core stability and opportunities for crossing the midline. Um, so what we're doing is we're actually helping children's learning through fun movement activities. So hopefully your children are with you now and we can have a go. One of the first activities that I'd like you to look at is moving like a caterpillar. So let's see, let's have a go at this one. With moving like a caterpillar, the idea is you put your hands on the floor and you walk your hands out away from you until 
into a plank for any parents who go to the gym. And then you walk your feet back in again. And then you walk your hands back down. So you're going from a plank and then your feet are coming in. So you're moving like a caterpillar. So I'm hoping everybody is having a go at that one. Let's have a look at a seal walk. To do a seal walk, um, you need to have just socks on, um, no shoes. So a seal walk is pretty much looking at the same position that we looked at before with the plank position, but you turn your feet underneath. So I'll just show you. Okay. I think we had a bit of a power cut here. Can everyone hear me again? I hope so. So we've looked at a caterpillar walk. We've looked at a seal walk. Um, children can come up with things like a bear walk where they are moving around with um, hands and feet. So they have straight legs, straight hands if they can do this. Walking along. So again, taking weight on their shoulders, building up their core stability. Um, children can come up with some of their own. And from my point of view is, as a parent, is just thinking about, let's have a look at some of the games children can play moving like animals. Are they building up their core strength? Are they building up their shoulder stability? Um, let's have a look at another one. This one I like to call the snake charmer. So with this one, if you can ask the children to lie down on their backs with their knees bent. So lying, lying like this. And then as the snake charmer sound plays, you can sing this with them. So it's almost do 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 as that music plays the children come up like a snake and then when they get to the top most of the younger children like this they can stick their tongue out and hit so they're sliding down they go back down to the music as the music plays, another one fills up their, um, their core stability. Another nice game for children, and with this one they don't actually realise that they are um, using their core stability and their shoulder strength. If you can get a small table tennis ball and put that on the floor um, and you could play this with your child or if they're siblings, you can have them both play. Each child has a line. You can draw that with a bit of chalk or a bit of masking tape and a table tennis ball. And the idea is that they have to bend down to blow the table tennis ball across the line and come back up again. So they have to take the weight on their elbows, on their shoulders, and push back up again. So they're all the time they're engaging their core muscles and their shoulder muscles. Another nice idea, and what I'm trying to do is think basic things that you would have at home, is the magic carpet. So all we need is a towel. Put the towel on the floor. Children go on their hands and knees, and the idea is they have to get from one end of the room to the other by moving their hands and knees to slip along the towel. And although that looks easy, it's actually really hard on your tummy muscles, but it's something that would be fun for the children to try. Another one we might like to look at is saying hello to a teddy bear. And depending on the age of your children, you can actually change um, the um, difficulty in this. So, this one, 
any child's favorite teddy. If you put it on the floor in front of them. So the idea is they are on their hands and knees in front of their teddy. And you can say to them, wave to your teddy. So first of all, they might lift that hand off. Then they might lift that hand off. Then you might ask them to lift their leg up or the other leg. Or you might, when they get good at this and you get building up that tummy strength, is they actually might be able to lift opposite leg and arm. And again, opposite leg and arm on this side. If you've got older children, what we might ask them to do is a similar thing with the teddy, but they're in a plank position. So again, can they wave to the teddy? Can they wave to the teddy? One leg up, other leg up. If they get very good at it, they can actually do that um, with their eyes shut. Another way of playing this, a similar game, um, plank position, have the teddy beside them, can they pick it up, put it on their back, hands down, pick it up, put it down with the other hand. So hopefully these are giving you um, lots of ideas to be able to do that. Um, another activity, um, if we look at crossing the midline, and again, what we're trying to do is take different parts of the body across to different um, sides, what we can look at is blowing bubbles. And a lot of children absolutely love blowing bubbles. So if you think about blowing bubbles as a child, first of all, because when we talked about um, developing those motor skills from the inside out, actually it's easier for the children to be able to pop the bu bubbles if you blow them quite close to them. Then if you want to um, make it a little more difficult, then you can start blowing the bubbles to the sides of the children. Sometimes if you ask them to stand on a piece of paper, so they've got to be very still and they've got to move their body to do those things. So if you think about standing still, blowing it to the sides, then they have to pop them. Then we can make it more difficult again by blowing um, bubbles to the opposite side, but saying, if I blow them to this side, you can only pop them with your right hand. So you're going across to the right hand, across there and across again. Same again, you could actually blow them to your feet and they actually have to um, cross their feet over to be able to get them. So popping the bubble there or popping the bubble there. You can do those activities. Another activity that looks at um, crossing the midline could be so if you've got, you could do it with your child or you could do it with siblings and they sit back to back, have a ball and they have to pass a ball from one side to the other. So that actually helps cross the midline. Sometimes we're quite um, used to doing, we do lots of activities where we go under, over with a ball, passing it down the line. But if we go under, over, side to side, passing it down the line, then children are actually getting that, um, crossing the midline again. If we then throw a um, roller ball or again with the bubbles, what we've actually got there is children actually having to follow a bubble in the air or follow a ball along the ground. And what that's doing is actually developing their visual tracking. And by developing their visual tracking, what we're actually doing is helping them when they get to school to be able to track print across a page. What we're also looking at is the more children move around and they get used to where they are in space, then they actually start understanding direction and a sense of direction which helps them when they come to write with their up and down in their writing, right to left writing, left to right writing. Um, and it just gives them an idea of where they are in space. It helps them mathematically. If children are moving backwards, they're more likely to be able to understand the concept of subtraction. 
So all of these things that we might have taken for granted, moving around like an animal, that children might just do for fun, what we're looking at is actually, it does have a big impact on their brain development and their academic development. And sometimes what we've done is try to actually make things go very quickly with children and we're very concerned about them being able to write their name. And although that is, for example, it is a very important milestone. There are a lot of things around play and activities that children should be doing way before we worry about them being able to have a pencil and being able to write their name. Um, let's think of some other activities we could do. Um, things like a skipping rope. What we can look at with a skipping rope Lie it along the floor. I think you might just be able to see it if I tip that forwards. And actually ask children to walk along it. Now what sometimes happens with children is when they're struggling to balance, they'll do it very quickly. And actually doing it very quickly is much easier than doing it very slowly. So actually asking children to move along heel to toe, as you can see, is really quite difficult. So actually sometimes when you've got children who are struggling with their movement, they actually try to move much faster to um, hide the fact that they're struggling with it um, than they would do normally. So actually asking children to slow it down can make a big difference. Quite often we um, have children who struggle to sit still and sometimes some of the sitting still aspect is around the fact that they need more movement. Sitting still is the most complex movement skill there is. So a lot of children need more time to move um, and have lots of experiences before they are able to sit still. So if we think about um, Hopefully you've got lots of different ideas there. You do also have the handout coming. Um, but it's things like, um, because we tend to be busy and we're rushing children around. Um, children, there's a, a neuroscientist in America who calls the um, children of this um, generation the container kids. And what he means there is that we actually um, spare, children spend much more time in containers now than they ever did. And now I know that sounds strange and I'm not completely anti-containers. So for example, I wouldn't expect a child to go into a car without being in a car seat. But a lot of children spend um, a lot more time in nice bouncy seats and chairs um, than they ever did when we were younger. And sometimes, if you think about it, there's a shop in the UK that has a beautiful teddy bear seat. And this teddy bear seat sits like this, and the teddy bear, the baby slots into the, in between the teddy bear's legs, and the arms go around, and there's a lovely soft cushion to hold the baby's head up. So the baby is actually very, very safe in this soft, lovely teddy bear. But that's all the baby is. The baby is safe sitting there, but the chair is doing all of the work that the baby, baby's body should be doing. So there's no need for the baby to actually hold themselves up. There's no need for the baby to learn to lift its head because the chair or the container is doing everything for them. So it's thinking about you know, how, when I talk to um, teachers, uh, quite often they'll say they have children who come to school um, in a pushchair who actually who are more than capable of walking. Children who come out of school with a book bag and immediately pass their book bag to their parents to carry for them. And if we're talking about needing strength and core stability and shoulder strength, we actually need children to be carrying some things themselves and actually taking a little bit of weight 
Um, I sometimes would ask my um, little grandson to help me with the shopping and put a couple of things in a bag that he has to carry. What's also sometimes a nice activity is when you come home from um, being grocery shopping is actually asking the children to put it, put it away for you. So picking them up and carrying something and something like flour or sugar is actually quite heavy. So looking at how you could do that with children and um, following activities that you would normally do um, at home, but actually asking the children to do them with you can make a big difference. Um, another thing that I'd like you to think about is, are your children battery or free range? And sometimes I think that we, even if we want to, even if we do allow our children lots of opportunities for movement, sometimes a lot of that movement is very structured. So they go to their football club, they go to their golf lesson, they go to their swimming lesson. But how often do children actually get the opportunity to play? and just um, use a lot of their imagination um, and be able to come up. And some of that is they develop resilience through that, um, trying to work out different uh, ways of doing things, working out their own games, working out their own rules. Um, there's a lady in America um, called Lenore Scanazzi, I think that's how you pronounce it. And she actually, um, took her son on the subway in New York and he was desperate to actually go home on the subway by himself and when he was nine she took him to the subway they got this subway every day so the child was very um, comfortable in knowing how to get home and she gave him some this was before mobile phones she gave him some quarters to actually be able to ring home um, if he got lost and he came, she left him there and he got home by himself and was very, very proud of having done that. And she um, put it on social media and there was a big kickback about this woman that she was voted the worst, one of the worst mothers in the world. Um, but actually what she was talking about is, you know, when do we decide that children can do things by themselves? When would be the first time that that child would be allowed to go on the subway on his own? When he is um, ready to go to secondary school, high school maybe? So it's around thinking about how many opportunities do we give children to have unsupervised play? Now, I don't mean dangerous play, but I mean thinking about how we can let children take some risks. Um, the gentleman who called children the container kids also talked about the bubble wrap generation. Bubble wrap generation brought up by helicopter parents because we run around after them and they climb on climbing frames and we're saying, don't go too high, don't go too high. And we don't let them do um, a lot of things. We're frightened of them hurting themselves. So it's around thinking about what opportunities do your children have um, to do activities where you want, that, that aren't totally structured, where they have to use their imagination, where they have to interact um, with other children um, and make up their own rules and sort out their own problems without ha actually having an adult sorting it out for them. I know that when I was a child, if I had gone home and said to my mom that someone was being nasty to me when we were playing, my mom would have said, oh, well, then come in. But I would much rather have stayed playing with my friends so I would fight my own battles and um, find a way of compromising, uh, cooperating with my, other, with my peers, which helps my social skills as well. So again, looking at how we help children develop that resilience, how we give them the opportunity for movement and how important movement is for children to do that. Another thing to think about also is that a lot of children nowadays are spending a lot of time on a screen. Um, and like I said earlier on, if they're sitting down, uh, spending significant amount of time sitting down and they're looking at a screen, then they're not going to be developing that core stability. But there's a neuroscientist in the UK called Baroness Susan Greenfield, 
and she's written a book called Mind Change. And in that book, Mind Change, she looks at children's brain development and she looks at a baby's brain and there are lots of brain cells there, but not many connections between them. She then looks at a three-year-old's brain and it's just a huge mass of connections. And if the more a child interacts with the world, and in general, it's through movement at that age, the more connections they make. And if you think about how we experience the world, so if I said to you there was a grassy slope outside and I wanted you to run down that slope, um, you would feel the um, wind in your face, you would feel the dislevel on the ground, you would feel that horrible moment when the top of your body starts going faster than your feet and you know you're going to hit the ground. But you would experience the world through those five senses. Now what Baroness Susan Greenfield is saying is that actually children who spend significant amount of time um, looking at um, a screen, instead of um, inter interacting with the world with their five senses, they're only interacting with two. And she actually now has evidence to show that children's brain development is being inhibited because they're not interacting in the way with all of their senses, which is what our bodies were set up to do. So some of it is going back to think about, we've made progress in a lot of ways, but some of the progress with our electronic gadgets, our bodies and our brains haven't kept up with that. And we're actually going against child development so it's one of the best places for a child, when we talked about containers, one of the best places for a child is lying on their tummy on the floor, a bit of tummy time, um, which is what our grannies used to do. So some of this is around thinking about um, what, can I, what can we do with children? We're very, very busy, but if we can take the time to help the child do their own buttons, or carry their own, undo their own zips and coats, um, rather than having to rush them out to do that. And I appreciate that in a busy world, sometimes we do do that. I know my grandson started school last week, he's four, and on Thursday he was absolutely exhausted. Um, suddenly going from being at home to spending full days in school, on the Thursday morning, I had been lying his clothes out and helping him get ready. And on the Thursday morning, he just sort of stood there. And I knew he was never going to get to school on time unless I helped him dress. So realistically, what I'm trying to say is that we need to give children the time to develop those skills rather than trying to rush them as I did um, to get to school. So hopefully what I've tried to do is give you a little bit of an idea of how important movement is. Children learn to move and then once they've learned to move, they start to be able to move to learn. They start to be able to um, they've got the, that brain development and they've got the skills of being able to sit still and listen. Because if I can't sit still at my desk, my brain is concentrating on keeping myself in the seat and my seat. It's not actually concentrating on what the, child, the teacher is saying. So our movements have to become automatic for us to actually be able to interact with the world and learn some other new things. So what I'd like you to do now is think of any questions you have. And as I said, no questions are silly questions. So any questions you have about why movement's important or any of the things we've done so far today, please feel free to ask them now. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to actually ask some. Thank you. Okay, these realistically, um, so the question is about can these be implemented from any age? And I think, um, yes, 
because what we're talking about is if you think about from babies we're, we're moving with babies we bounce babies up and down in our um arms we move babies around and actually by doing that we're building up their vestibular systems we're helping them learn about balance um lying on their tummies you know if tummy time is very important for children so actually being able to lie on your tummy with a little toy in front you can do that from being very very young obviously not until a baby gets too tired um but the movement, a lot of it is just you playing with your child and seeing what they can do and making sure they enjoy it because the more activities you can have with the children, the better it is. Um, what we call it is serve and return. So the more you giggle with your child and play with your child and tickle your child and lift your child up and they see you smile and they see you talking to them you're actually building up that relationship with you and one of the most important aspects of child development is that serve and return relationship with um, their family so a lot of it is there's no right or wrong it's about playing with your child and going with the kind of activities that they would like to do. Um, lots of the counting rhymes, um, things like row, row, row your boat, nursery rhymes, those kind of things are fantastic for children. But, and one of the most important things is you playing with them. So yes, from, from any age, and you can make them more and more difficult as the children get older. So well done for asking that question. Any more? No. Okay, for finger grip. Um, first of all, with the finger grip, going back to what we were seeing before, one of the most important things for the finger grip is making sure that you have good strong shoulders first. So a lot of those little activities that we were doing will actually help children with the finger grip. Um, lots of activities. Um, I sometimes do an activity where you can um, ask the children, some children find this hard, for, certainly for um, early on. And I sometimes put those little colored dots on my fingers. So I might go red, green, blue, yellow, red, green, blue, yellow. And then I say, touch the red, touch the blue, touch the green, touch the red, touch the green. So they get in lots of practice of moving um, their fingers. Another one that is nice with that is playing with Play-Doh. Um, and some of you might have heard of the, of the Door Disco. And the Door Disco um, is a quite a good game to play with your children. So you give them some Play-Doh, big chunk of Play-Doh, put some music on so they can be moving to the music, but then you're asking them to um, have the Play-Doh in their hand. And some of it might just be squeeze, 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 and then point. So when they're pointing, they're pointing and they're pushing in hard to their hand. So it's literally squeeze, squeeze, point, point, point. So all the time it's coming from here, but you're getting lots of that exercise of building it in. Then we can actually make a sausage with the Play-Doh. So again, dancing, so we're doing our squeeze, squeeze, our point, our point, our sausage, sausage, then squeeze, squeeze. So all of the activities that we're looking at are activities that are really good fun for children. Um, lots of things with, um, I like to use pegs. So if you're looking at your pegs, um, the ones with the metal inside with the spring and maybe giving giving children um, a paper plate and asking them to put pegs onto the outside of it. Um, sometimes we could play a tigging game where 
children have maybe four or five pegs on the back of their shirts and you run around and you have to um, try and steal somebody else's peg. So a lot of those games are good. You can actually build a tower with pegs, clipping them together and see how high you can actually make the tower with pegs. So that's quite a nice one. Anything that will build hand strength is good for actually building that, that grip. Okay, any more? I think for me, one of the most important things is, like I said, is about playing with your child, taking it as much time as you can to play with the child. Um, and there's no right or wrong. Play the things that they enjoy, be followed from their lead and look at lots of different things, equipment and things you might have at the, in the house. Um, things like, um, when they're taking their clothes off, getting ready for bed, getting them to roll their socks up and throw the socks into the washing basket. So they're actually learning to throw, but with something just at home. Um, another nice activity, I have a, a scarf here, a juggling scarf. And so with this one, you can do all sorts of things. So if I just show you, if we get the juggling scarf, if I'm doing that, making a big figure of eight shape, immediately you can see that I'm actually crossing the midline. So I can cross the midline with that hand, I can cross the midline with this hand. Then I can do things like um, make a big circle. So I make a circle, but then you might ask the children to make it even bigger. So you've got a bit of a squat going on there, so they're building their strength. So we can do it in this side. But again, we're then learning about shape. So we've made a circle, we could make a square. We could make a triangle. We can pass it around our bodies. We can balance it on our bodies and try and move without dropping it. We can throw it and catch it. And the nice thing about um, bits of equipment like this. Now, this is a juggling scarf, but any piece of fabric, the, the sheerer the fabric, the better it is. Um, if you throw that up in the air, it takes a long time to actually come down again. So for a young child, they've got lots of time to think about where am I putting my hand to be able to actually catch something. And again, that goes back to the visual tracking. Children watch and that helps their eyes then be able to learn about looking at print on a page. So lots of things that you have in the home, lots of nursery rhymes, and just getting the children to move around, um, even just putting a little bit of music on, um, looking at how they might move, um, like different animals, or just putting the music on, how, do, how does that make you feel? And what we're going to look at in one of the other sessions is looking at physical literacy and we're going to be looking at um, developing stability, locomotion and object control, um, which again will give us lots of different activities and every week we'll develop um, more and more activities for you to actually do with your children. And what we'd also like you to do is you know, I've given you some ideas. You've got some ideas on the handout, but I'm sure that between this session and the next session, you could actually, with your child, come up with some um, activities of your own that we can all share. And then we can maybe put them into the chat box and actually collate some others. So you've got lots of different activities that you can do with your children. So any more questions? I'm sure we could have, we've got five minutes left. I'm sure we could come up with um, some more because all of these, nobody knows who you are. So there's no, um, no asking a silly question. One of the things that parents often ask me is 
um, they get very concerned about developmental milestones with children. And, but like I said, what we've got to be thinking about with children is stage, not age. So I wouldn't be saying, oh, your child needs to be able to do this at this age and needs to be able to do that at this age. But they do develop in a, a specific way. So it's actually looking at where your child is, not looking at other children who, who might be the same age, but are at a completely different stage. But one of the most important things is actually giving your child practice and doing it over and over again. Can you remember how annoying it was when your child first discovered that they could leave go of something? So they'd be sitting in their high chair and they drop it. And the first time you do it, you think, oh, and then you pick it up and they do it again. And at first you laugh, but after a few times you're thinking, oh. But instead of thinking, oh no, I've got to pick that up again, what we need to be really happy about is that child knows how to pick something up and is now making a conscious decision to drop it. So we've got developing those motor skills. So all of those little things that children are learning and they want to do it again and again and again, that's where they're developing those pathways in the brain. And like I said, for all of us, movement needs to become automatic. So if I think, you know, when was the last time you thought about how you walk? You don't because it's automatic. But for a little one who's a year 12 months who's cruising around the furniture, all their body is focused on at that time is learning how to walk. But what, so our body prioritizes that movement so that we get the automaticity over our body so that we can then free up our brain space to concentrate on the other things that are very important to us. So like I said, we, we, through this movement, we were able to sit still. By being able to sit still, we're able to concentrate and we're able to listen to our teachers. If you think about having a fantastic artist, they wouldn't be able to paint any sort of landscape if they didn't have a stable base. It would be like asking them to paint something, a masterpiece, while sitting on a rowing boat on a choppy lake. If they're wobbling all over the place, they can't do it. And it's the same for our children. We actually need to give them that control over their body until they can start um, then concentrating on other things. So I hope that's given you um, a few things to think about. As I said, co please come up with any ideas um, of things that you've tried with your children between this session and the next session and share them in chat because all of us are always looking for new ideas. I get some of my best ideas from parents who are actually playing with their children um, and just having fun. Find out what your children like uh, and come back to us. So thank you very much, everyone. Keep asking any questions if there are any more. I'm here for another minute or so, I think. That's brilliant. It could, it, you know, we, um, we've got lots more. We've got another three workshops to do. Um, and we've got lots, lots of other activities over the next few weeks. Is that us all done?
Anastasia, can I just check? Are we finished? Yes, Leslie. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Was that okay? I'm sorry about that connection. I think we had a power cut. Okay. All good. Thank you very much.